How's it going everyone, this is MindBlank, welcome back to the channel and we're picking off where we last left off with the first time Hardline, the zero water cooling experience straight to hard tubing guide and build. So I was missing the fans last time and it's obviously pretty smart to have them on before you move forward. These are E-Loop fans running at 1200 RPM and are designed for high airflow and static pressure. The specs on them look mighty fine and they seem to be very quiet, but we'll have to see about that especially since I'm running 5 fans on this system. Alright, I'm going to quickly explain how the compression fittings work. As you can see there's two pieces, one that gets fixed onto your rad, pump or water block and the compression sleeving itself, which is three separate pieces on these alpha cool models. The sleeving is the first that goes onto the tubing, followed by the metal washer and lastly the gasket o-ring. So the idea here is that the sleeving will clamp down on this o-ring and tubing creating a tight seal, not allowing water to permeate. It's really basic if you think about it, but hey it works. Also the fittings themselves have gaskets on both ends, the one that goes into your water block and the one where the tube is inserted into. Speaking of which, I'm using PETG tubing for this build, not acrylic. I'm not going to go into the pros and cons of PETG versus acrylic and we'll keep it at just PETG is easier to bend level. This is 16mm external diameter and 13mm internal diameter. Simple math then tells us that the wall thickness of this tubing is 1.5mm, so yeah, it's pretty thick. Obviously fittings need to have the same inner diameter as the outer diameter of the tubing, otherwise you can't use them. But anyway, it's about time for the bands and you're going to need a few things for this. First and foremost is a heat gun. I'm using an alpha cool heat gun which has 3 heating levels. One is a mere 100 celsius, while two is 450 celsius, with the last one three 650 celsius. I will be using level 2 on it for all my bends. You also need silicon insert that is the same diameter as the tube internal diameter. This thing is flexible and its role is to prevent kinking when you bend the tube. You'll also need something to cut the PETG and I have here an alpha cool saw which gets the job done although it's not as easy as other options. Now alternatively you can use tube cutters, even a basic one like this will provide a reasonably good and fast cut. Last thing you'll need is water with a few drops of liquid soap in it. This is so you can easily get the silicon insert into the tubing. And yeah, you can use some sort of oil or other lubricant if it's easier for you. Right, so how about bending some tubes, eh? Well, I'm going to explain exactly how I did it as a beginner. You really need to get a feel for this, so I recommend you first experiment with a few pieces of tubing. I got the insert in and I'm placing the tube around 3 inches above the heat gun, which is set to level 2 or 450 celsius. The idea is to uniformly heat up the tube where you want the bend to be and the adjacent areas. Don't get the tube too close to the nozzle or you will burn it, also don't keep it too far away or it will take ages to heat up. Tube behavior really depends on the brand and I can only speak for Alpha Cool PETG here. It takes anywhere around 1 minute to 1 and a half minutes to get the tube to the desired temperature. Make sure to rotate and move the tubing left and right constantly. You need to be patient with this, don't force it and trust me you will know when it's getting close to the bending point since it will start warping. I found that Alpha Cool's PETG never behaves like a wet noodle when it's heated, it just becomes flexible but you still need to apply a tiny bit of force. Oh and don't bend too soon, I'll show you what happens shortly. When you feel it become malleable start applying a tiny bit of force and bend it. You need to give more heat to the top of the bend since it needs to stretch more than the underside. Always bend it a little bit more than you want since it tends to spring back a bit after you let it go. You can safely dip it in water to cool and harden it. So this is the bend that we made earlier and as you can see it looks ok and fairly smooth. Ok so if you try and bend it too soon this is what happens, it will bulge up and look very unsightly. It also becomes very frail, if you try to bend it it'll snap fairly easily. 
On the other hand, if you keep it too close to the nozzle and heat it up too much, this is what it looks like. I have the insert in here so you can better see, but it starts bubbling or exhibiting striations, which is obviously not good. One thing I found is that if you move the tube to the left and right of the actual bend, you can get a cleaner look. Heating up the PETG in these areas allows the external curvature to look more natural. Take note that there are limits to how close bends can be. And also you can't get a good looking bend if it's too close to the tube's end. Following this, you can cut the tube to the desired length and smooth it out with some plain sandpaper. Remember to chamfer the edges for an easy entry into the fittings. Otherwise, you'll have a difficult time or you can destroy the gasket inside. But using no more, no less than this info, I managed to do all the bends in this system. Some of them were tricky, I have to admit. I'm especially happy with this U-shaped bend and the fact that I got it on the first try. In my eyes, the only bend that could have been done a bit better is the one from the pump outlet to the GPU inlet. I should have done the 90 degree bend on the GPU water block a little sooner, but hey, it is what it is, right? If you're wondering how I got some of the tubing in places where it seems very difficult to do so, the answer is simple. For example, on this rad to pump inlet bend, I got the fittings and compression sleeves on and tight and finally screwed in the mobile end of the 90 degree fitting into the rad. Pro tip here, before getting your tubing in, make sure you don't forget anything else in areas that are hard to reach otherwise, like the CPU power for example. It's time to throw in some coolant in this build, Alphacool's Crystal Blue UV Reactive. Like I said in my previous video, I will tip the PC over in order to fill the reservoir. And I'm going to use this filling bottle, which makes things a whole lot easier. You need to only power the pump up, nothing else in case there's leaks, so I recommend using a separate PSU or disconnect the system's PSU from everything else but the pump. You can force a PSU on with the paperclip trick, and if you don't know it, you'll find links in the description. In my case, I'm using the power on tester that EVGA provided with their Supernova PSU. It's exactly as the paperclip trick, but wrapped in a nicer package. Very important here is that you stop the PSU before the pump runs out of coolant, otherwise you risk burning it. And with that being said, let's get rolling. Now that the system is filled up, you need to do a leak test for a while and make sure everything's nice and tight. I was lucky here and had zero issues. Also move the case around on all directions to dislodge air bubbles and top off the res if it's required. Leave the top of the res open for a while to air out the system. So this is how the build looks before powering it. I'm extremely happy with how it turned out and I really like the coolant color. It's too bad I don't have a UV strip yet, but I think it looks great nonetheless. I just hope I don't get tired of the coolant color very soon. And this is how the build looks powered on with the awesome Hue Plus unit doing its thing. I leak tested for around 2 hours before finally powering the system on. There were a lot of air bubbles trapped, but I think I got most of them out. 
If you're wondering about temperatures, they look great with around high 60s to low 70s on the 7700K at 5.1 GHz and 1.36 volts V-Core while stress testing. The RX Vega 64, however, is cruising along at 29 Celsius during load, which is a mere 6 degrees more than the ambient temperature I'm testing in. To be honest, this is beyond amazing and things look just as good when heavily overclocked with 34 to 35 Celsius peak temperature. And best of all, for me at least, these ELU fans are properly quiet even though there's 5 of them. Let me know if you guys want to find out more details on temperatures, overclocking and other stuff in the comments below and thank you for supporting this channel by subscribing. If you want to further support this channel's growth, check out my Twitter and Patreon pages linked in the description. See you next time everybody, bye bye.